So maybe while people are still filtering in, we can already slowly get started. Welcome everyone to this edition of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light Distinguished Lecture Series. As you know, this Distinguished Lecture Series is our main event uh, taking place only a few times per semester to invite the thought leaders worldwide in the science of light broadly understood. Uh, it's a particular pleasure today to have here with us uh, Steve Gerben from Yale. Um, uh, let me first briefly introduce him. Um, uh, we had planned an in-person appearance, but <laughs> due to the prevailing uh, um, problem of one of the prevailing problem of our times, he couldn't make it for today. Um, but we are still very happy that he can uh, give the talk uh, online. So uh, Steve Gervin is a theoretical physicist. He um, studied at Bates College and at uh, Maine University. And then he went to Princeton where he uh, concluded his PhD in 1977 in the field of condensed metaphysics, and his advisor was uh, John Hopfield. Uh, he then uh, went for postdoc stays at Chalmers University in Sweden and Indiana University, and afterwards he uh, went on to have hold a staff position, staff scientist position at the National Bureau of Standards uh, from 79 to 87, after which he became a professor uh, at Indiana University, where he rose through the ranks. Now in 2001, he moved again to Yale University where he has been ever since, uh, part of the time also as uh, uh, on various deputy provost uh, positions. Um, his general field of research uh, is uh, rather wide. So he deals with uh, correlated uh, many body systems, uh, phase transitions in such systems. He has uh, made major contributions to the theory of the quantum Hall effect uh, in the 80s and beginning of the 90s. Um, and then uh, after moving to Yale, he is one of the co-founders of the field of circuit quantum electrodynamics, that is uh, studying the quantum properties of uh, electromagnetic radiation um, in the microwave domain uh, trapped inside superconducting circuits. Um, he has won many prizes and fellowships and awards. Let me uh, emphasize that uh, he's the recipient of the Oliver Buckley uh, Prize in Condensed Metaphysics of the American Physical Society, together with James Eisenstein and Evan MacDonald in 2007 for the contributions to the quantum Hall effect. Um, he is one of the co-founders of the Yale Quantum Institute. And in 2020, he became the founding director of the co-design center for quantum advantage, uh, which is a very large enterprise uh, uh, binding together many institutions in the US. So um, we are really looking forward to this talk, which will give us an insight of um, how you can do quantum simulation, um, but not maybe using your standard qubits, but uh, um, emphasizing uh, those uh, properties that you can um, that you can efficiently simulate uh, if you have a particular physical system, namely harmonic oscillators. So um, without further ado, I hand over to Steve. Uh, he told me it's also fine if um, someone has a question uh, during the talk. In that case, I would uh, I hope you put your question in the chat and then I can still decide whether we take this at the end or whether I uh, unmute myself and ask Steve. And then at the end of the talk, we will have our usual question period. So with that, uh, Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. Um, it looks like from my Zoom background that I'm uh, at Yale, but <laughs> actually I'm in uh, Mainz, uh, where I've been, I arrived uh, with COVID and Iro Sonoma has been kindly uh, nursing me back to health this week. I'm sorry, I, I can't be there. Um, in person, I came close to getting to Erlangen, but didn't quite make it. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to uh, talk about work that uh, is done, experimental work in the lab of my colleague Rob Sholkoff by Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis, two uh, wonderful graduate students. Chris is now a postdoc in Chicago. And uh, the, I'm going to show you. 
an experiment that simulates using boson sampling the atomic vibrational spectra of some small molecules uh, as, as an example of how you can efficiently do, more efficiently simulate systems containing bosons if your hardware also contains bosons. And then uh, I'll also, uh, if I have time at the end, uh, mentions uh, some many body uh, lattice problems like the fractional quantum Hall effect and lattice gauge theories, which we're, we haven't done yet, but we're kind of looking ahead to what will be possible in experiment. So uh, you may not all be familiar with with circuit QED. So I'll, it's an it's uh, I'll just give you a quick uh, uh, overview. It's the analog of cavity QED in regular quantum optics, but it uses microwave photons instead of optical, and they're trapped inside centimeter scale, five gigahertz scale superconducting microwave resonators. And instead of natural atoms, we're using qubits, superconducting qubits, uh, based on Josephson junctions. And the qubits are enormous. They're millimeter scale, uh, and they essentially are atoms with an antenna attached. And so they, you, they get ultra strong coupling to the, to the microwave um, modes. And you can do strong coupling nonlinear quantum optics at the level of one and two photons. That's the, the um, big advantage here. So you're familiar with natural atoms and their characteristic petahertz uh, frequency scales. The spontaneous emission lifetime of the hydrogen 2p state is 1.6 nanoseconds. Uh, if you use that to define a Q of this thing as if it were a damped oscillator, you'd get about 4 million. And the transition dipole matrix element connecting 1s to 2p is by definition uh, about a Debye. Uh, our artificial atoms are going to be uh, made of aluminum films, uh, two halves of an antenna connected by a Josephson tunnel junction. They're going to be on a millimeter scale, characteristic frequencies in the gigahertz. It's useful to know that 21 gigahertz is a Kelvin, so you have to cool these things down near absolute zero. Uh, characteristic lifetimes are now um, 300 microseconds. That's a Q that's pretty similar to, uh, to the hydrogen atom. But the transition dipole moment is 30 million times larger. It's several Cooper pairs of electrons uncertainty on the capacitor plate charge multiplied by a millimeter. And this is where you get the super strong coupling to the microwave modes of the cavity. In fact, if you put this artificial atom in free space, it will, uh, it will spontaneously emit a photon in 100 nanoseconds. If you, you, we have to put it inside a cavity that doesn't have any modes at this guy's frequency in order to kill the spontaneous emission and make the lifetime 3,000 times longer. So it's that we use the Purcell effect uh, to lengthen the lifetime. So. Uh, we'll focus on one mode of the cavity. The, the, you know, this is a very small cavity, typically a half a wavelength in size. So that there's a single mode. The other modes are far away in energy. It's a harmonic oscillator. This is the number of quanta in it. The qubit is an anharmonic oscillator, but at some level of approximation, we can treat it as a two-level uh, pseudo spin. And if you detune the resonator from the qubit so that they can't directly, you know, dipole exchange energy only in second order perturbation theory, then you're in the dispersive regime and the effective dipole coupling looks, uh, turns into this dispersive coupling. And uh, so if you say, oh, the coefficient of A dagger A, that's the cavity frequency, then we see there's a new term that shifts the cavity frequency 
chi sigma z by an amount depends on the state of the qubit. If the qubit is in G, which I will sometimes call zero, the cavity frequency is here. If the qubit is in the excited state E, or which I, some, the, uh, I might call one, if I'm a computer scientist, the frequency will be here. Chi is typically negative, so that's why this is this way. And the key thing is that chi is several, can be as large as several thousand line widths. This is a scale of uh, dispersive coupling that's uh, only dreamt of in traditional uh, quantum optics because the, um, you know, the available uh, coupling strength in most material, nonlinearity in most materials is just not that high. Uh, uh, Steve? Yep. Can I, can I ask this as guy? In the dispersive coupling, somehow I would expect that the, the sigma z is the population difference. Should it not be like sigma x or something in the coupling? So the coupling, the original coupling is sigma x times a plus a dagger, which is the ah, yes, yes, right. Robbie yeah. Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. But because that is those um, are oscillating, this frequency is different than that frequency then in second order perturbation theory this is the dominant okay okay dominant I, I see. I, so the, I the way to interpret this is our artificial atom is a little you know like a little piece of glass you know it's got an index of refraction and it shifts the cavity frequency when you put it inside mm -hmm. but the index is different when you're in the ground state or the excited state mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, that's a good question. Thanks for I want to make sure that's clear. Okay, well, I can take this same Hamiltonian and just rearrange the terms and say, no, no, it's not the coefficient of A dagger A that depends on sigma Z, it's the coefficient of sigma Z that depends on A dagger A. That is, there's a quantized light shift of the qubit transition frequency and it changes by chi, uh, a two chi for each microwave photon that I add to the resonator. And so here's a here's some a very old data now showing the spectrum of the qubit measured by quantum jump spectroscopy. Uh, when there are you're you're irradiating the cavity with a classical drive and it has a coherent state in it, and sometimes there are zero photons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I told you these lines were broadened or separated by thousands of line widths, and it's true, but the graduate students were in a hurry and uh, <laughs> and did the spectroscopy uh, uh, fast enough that the lines were power broadened by a factor of 100. But uh, what I like to say when I'm talking to students is that uh, what you learn from this graph is that microwaves, despite their name, are particles. And they're perfectly good particles, just as optical photons are particles. And uh, this ability to make quantum non-demolition measurements, remember, we, we can, uh, with this spectro spectroscopy experiment, you put a tone on the qubit and you see whether it flips its state. Uh, and it will if the frequency is this and if and only if there's exactly one photon in the cavity, but it doesn't eat up the photon. The, the, coupling, the coupling commutes both with sigma Z and the photon number. So you can do Q and D measurements of the qubit state or the cavity state using this coupling. And this uh, suggests a way, a new low noise way to do axion dark matter detection, uh, uh, overcoming the terrible limits set by amplified vacuum noise. If you, instead of using linear amplifiers, you do quantum non-demolition photon counting, you can beat down uh, backgrounds and that that suggestion has now been realized uh, uh, experimentally by Aaron Chu at Fermilab. Okay, so that's just to give you some sense of the strange strong coupling regime that we're in. Uh, and now, if you want to know more about circuit QED, you can just go to my web page and download uh, more pages of lecture notes than you really want to see. <laughs> Okay, uh, so 
Uh, we're going to talk about building a programmable quantum simulator. What would we like to have? Well, we'd really like to have universal control, the same as for a quantum computer. We want to be able to create arbitrary non-classical states. And we want to be able to synthesize by applying gates and making certain, you know, trotter approximations and things, arbitrary evil time evolution under arbitrary programmable Hamiltonian dynamics. And then you want to see what state you got, what, 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 you know, what some experimental quantity you'd like to measure and, and its time dynamics. So you need to be able to make efficient and non-trivial measurements to probe the simulation results and hopefully not just measure things that experimentalists can say condensed matter can measure like transport but actual you know things like cold atom people can measure you know the real the wave function the state tomography that's not available let's say in in the real system that you're trying to simulate and circuit QED offers a number of advantages for trying to do this, as I hope I will now illustrate. So I'm going to show you some of the control capabilities and the novel measurement capabilities that we have, and then I'll illustrate them with a simulation of this molecular spectrum. So, uh, so here's our basic Hamiltonian. This guy is the important part, as I mentioned. And in addition to control things, we can put classical drives on the cavity to displace it in position or momentum, and classical Rabi drives on the qubit to rotate it around some axis uh, in the equatorial plane of the block sphere. And because the frequency of the cavity depends on the state of the qubit and vice versa. This strong coupling allows us to make uh, displacement operations on the cavity that are conditioned on the state of the qubit and rotations of the qubit that are conditioned on the cavity state because the qubit <coughs> resonance frequency depends on the cavity state. And, Together, these give provable universal uh, control. The, the Lie algebra, the commutators of all these things, does not close. OK, so uh, this control, uh, I've been talking to computer scientists, so I'm trying to use the word instruction set. Uh, and uh, this control lets you develop several different instruction sets, one we call SNAP. Uh, which is um, ar number dependent arbitrary phase gates. So an arbitrary state of the cavity is a superposition of different Fox states of N photons. And with this control, I won't, I'll skip the details, but it's very straightforward to apply a different Berry phase to each component of the wave function uh, different for each Fox state n, each photon number n. So that's a that's a, a remarkably expressive uh, instruction set. And then on top of that, but it it commutes with total photon number, doesn't change the number. And so the way we need one more instruction, which is cavity displacements like this. Um, and uh, another possible instruction set that we use is this um, con ca uh, qubit controlled cavity displacement. It's kind of the reverse. Here, we, depending on the state of the qubit, whether it's zero or one, we displace the cavity in phase space by plus alpha or by minus alpha. So this is. This is like the position of the oscillator, the momentum of the oscillator. I'm sitting at some point in phase space, and now I entangle the cavity with the qubit, <clears throat> pushing the cavity to here if the qubit is in zero and to here if the qubit is in one. Then I do a rotation of the qubit to some new orientation that puts this blob into a superposition of the zero and one, and then you can split it again and get four blobs and eight blobs and 16 blobs. And that's what this circuit does. Uh, so 
uh, you can use this particular instruction set to uh, make Fox states with one, two, three, four, five photons. And this is data. It looks like Wigner functions, but actually it's the characteristic function. It's the expect, it's the overlap between the quantum state and a displaced version of itself. It's kind of the autocorrelation function uh, uh, of the state. <laughs> and uh, using this control displacement, you can do an interfer uh, interference experiment that lets you measure this overlap. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, beautiful uh, circularly symmetric bullseye patterns with the number of nodes uh, related to the number of photons in the state. And you can make these states with very high, uh, very low infidelity and uh, in a very small number of uh, circuit oper gate operations in this instruction set. Here you can see uh, making squeeze states uh, internal to the cavity, not external. And here's a, almost 11 dB of squeezing. This is Position is now much better defined than in the vacuum, and momentum is much less uh, sharply defined in order to preserve the area of the state in phase space. Here are some uh, funny uh, superpositions of zero, two, and four uh, photons that make a particular type of quantum error correction code state. Here's a different quantum error correction code state, the GKP code. It's roughly a Schrodinger cat living in 35 places at once in phase space. It's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's, on a, it's on a grid in phase space and uh, pretty, pretty uh, novel uh, states that are made rather easily with these instruction sets in, uh, you know, circuit depths of 10 or 12, 14. Okay, so, um, in addition to the Wigner and characteristic function tomography that we can do, we can do very efficient boson number sampling by doing a binary search to find the boson number. And that's going to be important for the um, molecular spectroscopy that I'm going to tell you about. So I'm going to spend a little time on that now. So uh, suppose you know, we could ask different questions about the photon number. I could ask the question, is the photon number equal to one, yes or no? So I, it's a one bit answer. Is it equal to 13, yes or no? And uh, I have an ancilla qubit, which is coupled to the cavity. And because the frequency of the qubit depends on how many photons are in the cavity, I can do this conditional gate, which will uh, apply a pi pulse to rotate the qubit from ground to excited state, which is exactly what we did in the spectroscopy of the qubit. And it will be effective <clears throat> if and only if the number of photons in the cavity is a specified number, because I've picked the frequency of this tone. And so uh, and then I measure the qubit and I either get zero or one. And that answers this question. Now, I'm going to show you an example with two cavities and a, and a total of 256 possible photon numbers. And if you measure them one at a time, the answer is almost always no. There's not that many photons. You know, it's like... Um, uh, playing the game of 20 questions with my grandkids since, you know, uh, uh, I'm thinking of a number between one and a million, and they say, is it 372,419? And I usually say no. You know, they don't understand the binary search, but they should ask a question where you don't know the answer most of the time, then you get one bit of new information. Is it bigger than half a million or smaller? Etc. So that's what we're going to learn how to do. But, the, but first, let's start with this simple case. To do this, if you want to ask, is there one photon in the cavity or not, 
you take advantage of the fact that the spectrum of the qubit is like this, and you shine a pi pulse at this frequency, and it will flip the qubit if and only if there's one photon. So that's what this gate does. And again, I remind you, it's quantum non-demolition. I can repeat the experiment several times to get rid of uh, you know, uh, gate errors and measurement errors. Um, and uh, um, the photon is not absorbed in this process. OK, unlike in a photomultiplier. OK, well, I could ask trickier questions that still have a one-bit answer. So a question like, is the photon number equal to either one or three? I don't care which, yes or no. And you just apply two tones, one at this frequency and one at this frequency. And if the, one, if the photon number is either one or three, it will flip. But you won't know which pulse caused it to flip. And so generalizing this, for example, if I put uh frequencies corresponding to n equals one three five seven nine eleven i could measure the photon number parity without measuring the photon number and in fact i can measure any binary function of the photon number what i mean by binary function is i have a a thing which will uh, a gate which will flip the qubit a pi pulse uh, according to the value of this projector and the coefficients uh, uh, in this sum over photon numbers, the coefficients are either zero or one in this vector, um, uh, which is why we call it a binary function. So if CM were uh, zero, except for one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, 11, I would have the parity uh, measurement. So what we do uh, in the experiment in a, we have uh, a cavity, we're going to have two cavities, but let's say one cavity for now, and the, <clears throat> there are 16 possible photon numbers between 0 and 15. And we're going to do a binary search to find that, uh, that photon number and get four bits of information with every measurement. So it's a sequence of it's a single shot measurement a single shot determination i do this first controlled unitary which is this binary function and it says flip the qubit if the photon number is in the upper half of the range and don't flip it if it's in the lower half and then <clears throat> i do this uh, binary function here. Let's say the first result is that it's in the upper half. Then this is going to measure whether it's in the upper half or the lower half of that upper half, and so on down until you're finally measuring the parity. So there, it's one shot, and it takes advantage of the fact that these measurements are quantum non-demolition to do four of them with intervening unitaries in a single shot of the experiment. And this carries out the walsh hadamard transform of the photon number. And from the measurement results, uh, you can determine the four bits of the binary number that represents how many photons are in the cavity between zero and, uh, which is represented by zero, 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 zero and 15, which is represented by 1, 1, 1, 1. And the, so you can, uh, this is exponentially more efficient than asking, is the photon number 0? Is it 1? Is it 2? Is it 3? Uh, because it takes only log of the, <coughs> the, the number of queries, uh, uh, because it directly determines these binary digits uh, in the in the photon number. OK, so we're going to use this control and measurement toolbox uh, for hardware efficient of physical models containing bosons. And an interesting problem that contains bosons is the vibrational optical vibrational spectra of molecules, the, the mechanical vibration of the molecules are oscillators. They're not generally harmonic oscillators. And in this first experiment, we're going to approximate them as harmonic. 
Uh, so it's you know re uh, relatively simple thing which we can check uh, our results analytically. And uh, it turns out you can map this problem of finding the spectrum, the Frank Condon factors, onto as onto a boson sampling problem, as these guys from Xanadu did, uh, in which you <clears throat> you have a bunch of beam splitters. Actually, we're doing Gaussian boson sampling, where these are uh, both beam splitters and two mode squeezers, and you start with some number of quanta in the initial vibrational modes. And then you do something to change the Hamiltonian, which is represented by all these beam splitters and interference effects. And then you measure, you end up with different numbers of quanta in different vibrational states. I'll, I'll explain that in more detail. So, it's, but it's equivalent to boson, uh, Gaussian boson sample. Okay, so you probably, I'm sure all familiar with this simplest example. If I have a, a, a spring and mass model of a diatomic molecule, and the spring is the, uh, is the electronic uh, chemical bond whose energy varies with uh, the length, of the bond length. And, uh, and then I send in a high energy photon and eject one of the bonding electrons, uh, then the bond is less strong and its equilibrium position will shift to a larger value suddenly. <clears throat> the spring constant may also change, but for simplicity, I'm going to ignore that. So the Hamiltonian, which is harmonic oscillator that's suddenly displaced by a step function at time zero <coughs> looks like this. And the idea is that you should start in whatever the ground state is of the first Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian changes so suddenly that the electron has no time to respond. And you have to project it onto the eigenstates of the new Hamiltonian. And sometimes it's not in an eigenstate it's an eigenstate of the old Hamiltonian, not the new one. So you end up sometimes here and sometimes here and sometimes here and sometimes here. And these probabilities are the Frank Condon factors that we're trying to uh, calculate. And of course, this can be done analytically. This is a Poisson distribution for this simple case. <coughs> the uh, so. So we're gonna study now triatomic molecules and look at the stretch and bending modes, let's say of uh, water. <clears throat> and these two mechanical modes, the quanta in there are gonna be represented by the quanta of microwave photons in these two uh, resonators. And we're going to, effect the unitary transformation from the old Hamiltonian to the new one using three ancilla transmon qubits to help help us do that. And the fact that our, our I'm going to emphasize the fact that our hardware contains bosons makes this simulation vastly more hardware efficient. It's just got five quantum parts, two empty boxes and three qubits. <coughs> Sorry, I'm uh, still <laughs> after effects of COVID here. So we have two oscillators and two position coordinates, the, the amplitude of the bending motion and the amplitude of the stretching motion. And the nuclei are moving on a two-dimensional uh, potential energy surface set by the, the bond uh, strengths and bending. And you're going to suddenly go from here to a different two-dimensional potential energy service. And we want to get that uh, transformation. And it's particularly important to notice that when the high energy photon comes in, it removes one of the electrons, let's say from this bond. Uh, and so it breaks the mirror plane symmetry of the molecule. It, wake, it changes this spring constant more than this one. And so as a result, the, uh, the, the potential energy surface do here doesn't have to have the same symmetry axes as this one. Uh, and that's illustrated here. So uh, here's the 
initial potential energy surface for the nuclei, which we got by solving the, uh, the fermion problem, all the, you know, the chemical bonding on a classical computer using uh, density functional uh, type approximations. And we, we do make an approximation that this surface is quadratic, that is the oscillators are harmonic. And you'll see it's an elliptical surface because the two modes have different spring constants and different effective masses also. Uh, but the symmetry axes are aligned with uh, bend and stretch modes that we talked about. But once you remove an electron and break that symmetry, the new potential energy surface has uh, a new symmetry axes that are uh, rotated. So the modes are now mixed coherently. Uh, the minimum is displaced and the spring constants have also changed, okay? So this is a more complicated version of the simple story that I showed you. And the, the chemists uh, all follow this guy, Dr. Roth, who in 1977 figured out how to evaluate the general case of the, the um, unitary transformation from the basis states of the blue surface to the gold surface. And we're going to execute that in our simulator. Uh, so what do we need? Well, these Anadu guys have pointed out, you know, the requirements. You need bosonic modes. You need uh, Gaussian operations like beam splitters to couple the two modes and induce this uh, rotation of the symmetry axes. You need displacements <clears throat> and you need squeezing and you need non-Gaussian state preparation, and you need number resolved detection. And these things are becoming possible in conventional quantum optics, but uh, uh, are still not so trivial, and they're relatively straightforward uh, for us, as I've tried to illustrate. Okay, so here's the circuit that does the quantum simulation uh, published here. Uh, we have uh, cavity A, Alice, and cavity B, Bob. There's a transmon qubit that couples them, and they each have their own ancilla qubit to help us uh, control the states. So first you initialize the state of everything so that the ancillas are all in the ground state, and cavity A has a specified state, and cavity B has a specified state like um, this one has one photon and uh, one phonon, and this has two phonons, let's say. Then you have to execute this Doctorov transformation that suddenly changes the basis from the old potential energy surface to the new one. And when we execute that uh, transformation, the um, it's supposed to be that the ancilla qubits all end up back in their ground state. But sometimes there's an error and quite often that error manifests itself as the ancilla not being in the ground state. So we check that and we reject post-select removing five to 10% of the shots because they've raised a, an error flag. Then we make number resolving measurements of the number of quanta in each cavity and then figure out what the spectrum looks like by the probability of those occurrences. Now, the Doctorov transformation in this little box is itself a complicated gate sequence. You squeeze the first cavity, you squeeze the second cavity, you turn on a beam splitter to rotate the symmetry axes by coherently mixing the two modes. You do another squeezing operation on each one, and then you displace each one, and then you uh, make the, the measurements. So here's the results for, let's say, water getting photoionized and leaving behind with this a certain symmetry subset, and there was only two of the vibrations, no rotations, et cetera, starting from the vibrational ground state. And the solid black lines are the exact spectrum calculated for this Hamiltonian model. And if we do the slow way of determining the number of quanta in each cavity, is it zero, is it one, is it two, is it 15? The data are these purple dots. 
and you can see quite good uh, uh, agreement with the spectrum. The exponentially faster sampling, 32 times faster in this case sampling, where we, we do four separate Q and D measurements of different quantities in, in the same shot, is a little less accurate, but it is 32 times uh, faster. And you can ask, well, what is the, you know, how accurate are these results? Well, you can, one measure is the L1 norm distance between the exact and experimental probability distributions for the number of quanta i and j in each of the two modes. And for the, the slow but accurate method, it's a, the distance is about 5%. For the 32 times faster efficient sampling method, the L1 distance is about 15%. Um, <clears throat> I want to emphasize, you know, that uh, the typical photo detectors are not number resolving and they are destructive. And here we have this efficient Q and D single shot boson number sampling. We measure a total of 256 photon states, zero to 15 in each of two cavities by measuring the eight bits of the photon number distribution uh, each time. And that's why you get this, uh, this exponential gain. Uh, and 256 divided by those eight measurements is a gain of a factor of 32. Uh, we've, you can program this to do uh, other molecules. Now, one of these is ozone, I think. And, uh, you can start in different non-classical states, say uh, phonon number one in the bend and two in the stretch, uh, and, and get rather different looking results, etc. Um, and I also want to emphasize that um, if you try to do this simulation on, let's say, the Google uh, supremacy machine, you couldn't do it because you you it uses only qubits and not oscillators. So to represent the eight bits of information on the vibration number, you would just need eight qubits just to store that and then many more qubits to uh, execute the unitary transformation, which contains funny matrix elements of the A and A dagger operators like square root of N that you have to compute in quantum arithmetic on your processor. So it would take thousands of gates on an ordinary quantum computer. So uh, we, we like to, <laughs> as a joke, we say this is clearly not a, a simulation that shows supremacy over classical computers, but it, it does show supremacy over all existing ordinary quantum computers based solely on qubits. Um, I have uh, two minutes left, I guess. So. I'll just bring okay, a little bit more. We start a little bit later. Okay. Uh, so you can imagine now that this is working. What could we do with, let's say, a big lattice of microwave resonators that are coupled together by beam splitters and have various ancilla controller qubits attached to them? You should be able to do simulations of one and two and maybe even 3D models containing uh, bosons. And in particular, I'm interested in the, the, the Bose-Hubbard model for charged particles in a magnetic field. So can I trick microwave photons into thinking they're charged particles in a magnetic field? And it turns out uh, you can. Uh, you, you make beam splitters, which will hop you from here to here. And we have a way of uh, uh, controlling the phase of those beam splitters so that when you go around the loop, uh, you pick up a net phase as if this were a charged particle moving in a static vector potential magnetic field. Uh, using the snap gates, you can program this uh, uh, Hubbard repulsion between the, the um, uh, microwave photons. And so you have all the pieces you need to study uh, the superfluid insulator transition, Bose glass, fractional quantum Hall effect, uh, in which you could have uh, quasi 
whole excitations that consist of half a photon. <laughs> you remove a photon and it breaks up into two unconfined objects that move through the lattice. And uh, so we eventually we can't do it now, but we, we've got all the pieces demonstrated at small scale. And once we can do this at large scale, we you know you could do interesting uh, quantum simulations of correlated many body fluids of, of bosons. Uh, we're also interested in lattice gauge theories. And uh, in a lattice gauge theory, the bosons hop, but it's not a fixed vector potential they're hopping in. There's a dynamical variable on each link, which let's say sigma z of this ancilla, which is fluctuating in time. Uh, and uh, it gives you things like confinement and uh, so forth. And uh, this, this interesting uh, model, which is called a Z2 gauge theory, uh, is our first target that we're trying to write down how you would, what the instruction set is that would simulate that. And it turns out that an ordinary beam splitter sandwiched by a snap gate, which is just a, a conditional parity operation, essentially a controlled parity gate, uh, it applies e to the i pi over two photon number uh, to one of the one of the two uh, resonators you're hopping between, conditioned on the sign of the, the sigma z, and so it's a snap beam splitter snap gate like that. And we've also figured out how to measure the gauge invariant propagators and all the other interesting correlators uh, in this model. Uh, so uh, here are the guys that did it, Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis in Rob Shulkoff's lab. Uh, you saw some of the data, the, the simulation data was in inverse uh, wave numbers. So you know we must have been collaborating with actual chemists who taught us how to do that. Uh, and Ai Chuang helped us do the um, complexity calculation to show that uh, the uh, Qubit only quantum computers of today's era would, would have a hard time uh, simulating the results that are repeating, duplicating the results that we got. Uh, many, many people have helped us over the years develop all of this uh, technology, including uh, our friends in, in the Deborah lab. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. I clap on behalf of the audience. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for the wonderful talk. Um, so the talk would be open for questions now. And as usual, one of the ways you can ask a question is write something in the chat or say Q in the chat and I will call upon you. Or if you like, you can also directly unmute you. So who wants to start uh, with a question on the talk? Maybe while people are thinking, I can. Uh, oh, I see Michelle has a question. So, Michelle, maybe go ahead, unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks very much for the talk. <laughs> um, so, of course, the like Hubbard model and fractional Hall effect scenario got me interested. And I was wondering so, the sketch that you had, um, am I right to speculate that the, the couplers will there have Josephson junctions themselves and maybe be tunable DC squids? Uh, yes. So what we want, so these are funny kinds of beam splitters. We intentionally make each cavity have a completely different frequency. And then uh, to make it look like bosons hopping from site to site in sites that all have the same energy, uh, the beam splitter is actually a free, a nonlinear device that uses four wave mixing to, and two pumps. And it takes a photon from cavity A at its frequency and it gives it enough or takes away enough energy that it's now on resonance with cavity B. So uh, the beam splitter is a bilinear device, but if you want to switch it on and off, you have to have a nonlinear mm -hmm. uh, device. So we use, a transmon-like, um, very weakly anharmonic uh, thing, and we use 
uh, two pump tones whose frequency difference is the difference of the cavity frequencies. So then you can give the photon going from Alice to Bob the energy you want by moving a pump photon from one pump to the other. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I think so. So the, and the pump is applied to the, um, to the uh, flux loop of, of this transmont couple. Well, you can, you can flux pump, you can electric field pump. There are different ways okay. to do it, but yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And you can use three-way mixing or four-way mixing. There's, there's, a, there's a collection of things that we're experimenting with because you know, that, the, these kind of beam splitters are, we really need to route bits around in, in a computer that would be based on uh, on uh, bosonic modes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So I see there are already questions in the chat. So the first one is a more general one where, uh, where probably the answer can be as long as we have time, namely the question just says, does this research also serve quantum computing as opposed to quantum simulation, which you take? Yeah, I think, you know, any tools that we can develop, better beam splitters, better measurements, better um, control capabilities, they all serve uh, for improving the possibilities of, of gate-based uh, computation, um, but the I'm just using quantum simulation of correlated systems as a kind of motivation for, for that, but it, it serves both purposes. Okay, very good. So, um, Andre Pschera, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, so in the beginning, you mentioned that um, around your resonators, you have another resonator that um, basically by the Prissel effect uh, suppresses the radiation out of your uh, quantum resonators um, to the environment. And right. So I was wondering if this is something that is implemented like right on the chip or on the circuit board, or do you have to wrap the whole thing into some kind of a metal foil? Yeah, so when we first started and, and, and uh, the, the present architecture at Google and IPM and other places, it's a two-dimensional uh, uh, plane and they're, they're what are called coplanar resonators. Uh, but the particular thing I showed you is just go to the machine shop and make three-dimensional um, uh, post cavities they're called they're just a tube and there's a quarter wave uh, center conductor down at the bottom and there's an electromagnetic mode uh, trapped down near the bottom and you drill a hole in the side and, and stick a piece of sapphire in there that has the qubit on it and uh, stick it into the cavity to couple it to whatever strength you want okay let's see thanks Okay, very good. Uh, are there more questions from the audience? Maria Chikova? Oh, ah, yeah. Um, Masha? Thank you. I'm, I'm not even the first. Mario is first. But, but okay, thank you very much. And uh, for, the, for the talk as well, it looks like these uh, qubits are so powerful. The nonlinearity you have is so strong. So uh, you obviously, you, you spoke about forward mixing, for instance. How far can you go in the nonlinear processes with how many uh, photons involved? Uh, three, four, five, six. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, well, um, uh, the dominant, the easiest thing to do is four wave mixing. So, with one classical pump, you can you can do three quantum. You know, th three of the four modes could be quantum. Uh, but it's also possible to gang these together and try to make uh, sixth order nonlinearities. It's that experiment has been done. It wasn't. It's not great. I mean, uh, uh, it's a little bit hard. Um, there are other effects if you just drive really hard. I mean, you can get <laughs> you, you know almost anything you want to happen, but maybe not under your completely under your control. So typically. Um, <clears throat> um, 
you know, we we use four wave nonlinearity and typically stop there. Okay, thank that's, you. At least for now, that's what we do best. But it, you know, ultimately, we could probably do more. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, very good. So maybe next one would be Mario Mario Pen. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks a lot for this talk. So I had a question that is related to one that was already asked before, namely the connection to quantum computing. Um, so you showed that your architecture is can solve one problem uh, better than standard quantum computers. But is it strictly stronger? So can you can you do everything that the gate-based quantum computer can do? For instance, Shor's algorithm and so on. Um... Well, we can do Schwarz algorithm as well as anybody else can't do Schwarz algorithm. <laughs> at okay, this point. Awesome. But yes, uh, you know, so this is uh, there are sort of two modes of operation. The information is in the qubits, and the communication is through the bosons, or the 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 other way around. Uh, and we've been pushing this sort of reverse thing, where the information is stored in the oscillators. Uh, because first off, they have higher Q than the qubits, and they have a simpler error model, and they have a bigger Hilbert space than a qubit. And so uh, we're, we're, we've been able to show that the bosonic architectures are much better for quantum error correction. So if you look at the quantum error correction literature, nobody in any technology um, with qubits has been able to do error correction that actually makes things better. Uh, they don't advertise that. <laughs> it makes things roughly a factor of two worse. That's the, the current record. Uh, but there are several now bosonic codes uh, experiments um, based on these ideas, which have, have um, either reached break even that they're not making things worse and even uh, made it uh, information live 50% longer, uh, which is the current world record. Uh, it's pretty bad. I mean, we want it to be 10,000 times longer if we're gonna do all this trouble of doing error correction, but you have to start somewhere. So, so the idea is that the cavities, you know, it's just an empty box, essentially no moving parts. Uh, and you can, you can have a bigger Hilbert space that corresponds to having several qubits. But it's a very simple error model. It's just a damped oscillator. And, and, and if you had several qubits, you have to figure out which one had the error. And was it an X, Y, or Z error? And, and it, those things are very hard. Whereas with an oscillator, it's all in one mode. And uh, you, can then, you can then take an array of such oscillators once you've defined logical qubits in them, and they're already error protected, so they have a low error rate. And then you can make a surface code or whatever you want out of them as the next layer of error correction. So that's kind of what we're hoping to, to pursue. And you know, we're not there yet, but that's where we're trying to head. Very good. So uh, I think Gerd had his hand up. Gerd, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's great. I, so I had a question regarding the snap gate. So how in, in these uh, microwave circuits, how big a phase change can you realistically get? And what is the influence of losses? They are probably extremely small, but there must be some. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't explain how it works, but I showed you that you because the frequency of the qubit is different for each photon number, I can just focus, let's say, on the case of photon number three, right? Mm -hmm. And so I apply a pi pulse that rotates the qubit, let's say, around the x-axis from zero to one. Then I shift the phase of the drive and I rotate it back along a different uh, longitude line on the globe. And I can, I can make that longitude line be anywhere and I can get any phase, any berry phase from the enclosed area between okay. zero and yeah. pi. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like I shifted the frequency as best I could and hope to get a little bit of a phase shift. It's, it's a berry phase that's completely under my control. Mm -hmm. And 
Yeah. And, it, and I can use a different tone at the very same time and choose a different path on the black sphere if there are five photons mm -hmm. <laughs> all at the same time. It's, it's mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> And and the um, you so you don't have much influence of any losses because losses are small enough. Well, if you get up to so in the experiment I showed you, we stopped at fifteen photons mm -hmm. because up there the the rate of photon loss from fifteen to fourteen is starting to get high enough that it's you know beyond that it's starting to affect the the results. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very good. So Vahid also wants to ask a question. Hi, uh, Steve. I am not sure if I understood um, in your uh, simulation of vibrations of water molecule whether you were considering these to be harmonic oscillators or are you also able to take into account anharmonicity of the potential? Right. So good question. So I, in the first experiment, we made the simplifying assumption that the, the excited state could be, uh, was still both initial and final potential energy surfaces were quadratic, that it was a harmonic oscillator, but we allowed the spring constants to change and the symmetry axis to change. Uh, in a subsequent experiment, which is on the archive, but not yet published by the same uh, graduate student, Chris Wang, we looked at a conical intersection uh, where the ground and it, or the two electron, the two potential energy surfaces actually meet at a like a Dirac point. So uh, and looked at the dynamics there. That's a very important process in chemical physics. For example, the rhodopsin molecules in your eye that that uh, tell the optic nerve that they just absorbed a photon use that. Uh, that right. But, but if you but I, I guess what I'm trying to uh, get to or clarify uh, is if you really want to uh, simulate real molecules, then you have to have a way to go away from a quadratic potential. Is there a possibility to to do even something that's a little more potential? Yeah. Uh, yes. So um, so the the the. Um... I mean, this uh, Dirac cone thing is itself not really harmonic. That's why I mentioned it. But but um, uh, what we'd like to do next is an arbitrary anharmonic potential. For example, photo dissociation, where the spring actually breaks. Right? We'd like to be able to do those things. Uh, that is harder in the sense that what you have to do is to determine the spectrum, you have to conditionally change the Hamiltonian depending on the state of your qubit. The qubit represents the dipole operator that connects the two potential energy surfaces. And so you have to, if the qubit is in one, you have to conditionally synthesize an anharmonic potential in the oscillator. And uh, it's possible to do that. We know how to do it using our gate set, but it's um, it's harder. And we have we have you know I haven't talked the experimentalists into trying it yet. But it's the next thing on my to do list. Yeah. And then be because you have the conditionally realizing it, then you have the system partly evolving on the lower surface and partly on the upper, and you can interfere them to see the overlap and get the spectrum out of that. That's why you have to do it. Very good. So um, I think we should uh, slowly come to an end. Uh, we've had plenty of questions and a great talk. And so Steve, thank you very much again. And to everyone else, I say the last DLS talk is um, by Joyce Poon, actually, I think in two weeks from now. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve, and have a good day. Well, thank you all for your great questions. And sorry I couldn't meet you in person. <laughs>